Long-term listeners to the channel will know that I quite slavishly stick to the Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule for delivering stories for your listening entertainment. Well, that leaves me with something of a dilemma. I have got so many series on the go at the moment that it doesn't leave much time for other stories if I stick those into the regular schedule, so I've um, started to adopt a Sunday evening special where I do um, episodes of the various series I'm doing on a Sunday evening. Earlier on, I asked you to vote for the one you wanted me to do today. And truth be known, the winning story um, was going to be about a 90 minute long narration, so I just didn't have time to get it done. So. Hopefully you'll like part six of the uh, paranormal investigation series that I've been doing. So my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And on this Sunday evening, listen. I'm not sure how she knew what the beach looked like. Maybe she'd taken a trip down in her childhood. Although I'm not sure how she could have if she was but a peasant. Especially considering where she must have been. The Dead Sea's waters are so saline that they're effortless to float in. The water is also a very distinctive turquoise. Scores of people come here on vacation, as it truly is an experience. We both stood on the beach, facing the setting sun, which threw itself onto the clouds in front of it like a sheet of beautiful red, purple and orange paint. Their puffy structures drank it all in, and reflected it back to us tenfold. This was a sight I'd not seen in a while. Not to say that sunsets aren't nice in Kandahar, but something about the desert atmosphere or the heat must distort them, because they're never the same as the ones back home, or this. I asked her, Lana, how do you know what the Dead Sea looks like? She turned to me and giggled. <laughs> Silly, I don't. But you do. At least she was in a good mood. My voice was emotionless and flat as I said, Well, I love what you've created for me. <laughs> Thank you. She was not at all disturbed by my lack of emotion. She ignored it and kept being her usual self, smiling and saying, Well, if it helps any, that was why I was silent for so long. This brought a smile to my face to know that she was not just suffering alone as I thought she had been. She turned, looking beyond us, and said, We should lay down for a bit. We don't have long. To which I merely grunted in acknowledgement, and we fell in tandem gracefully onto the towels that were laid out on the ground behind us. Her hand found mine, and our fingers interlaced. Her skin was comfortably warm against the cool breeze that began blowing in from the shore. I looked over at her, examining her body once again. This time she was wearing something at least. A light white dress, light enough to make outlines where it fell against her, but not enough to see through. She noticed me looking and said in response, I must have some modesty. After all, if you always have what you want, will you ever truly want it? I grunted again, rolling over and pulling her in close. My thoughts began to drift to Gabe. He was on a gurney beside me, and I knew it. Lana said to me, It's not your fault, John. But it is. If I hadn't frozen, he never would have had to run back out. He'd be fine. You had no choice in the matter. What if I hadn't? None of it matters now, John. Just relax. You know that's not possible. They're about to nuke this base. But this... She moved her body out of my embrace and shifted my head towards her chest, pressing me into her bosom. Just trust me, John. And I did. I shut up and sat there for a while. And, not surprisingly, it worked. Although my thoughts still wandered, I felt safe in the somewhat suffocating warmth of her chest. The power of a woman's chest is not to be underestimated. However... I had questions for her. I was about to ask her, why me? But there was no need to speak. She responded solemnly, literally reading my mind. Because you are the only one I can truly relate to. We may have had different experiences, but the result was the same. Then another thought popped into my head, and I asked without speaking. 
It's the only thing you can dream about, huh? I felt her head move down in a show of sadness. Yes. Every time I fall asleep. Until I met you. At this, she squeezed me tighter. I did the same. I thought, that's enough to drive a normal person mad. Has it driven you mad? She remained silent for a bit before responding. Enough to want to run away with a man I know nothing about, except for that we mutually want each other's company. I chuckled at this and spoke again, ponderously. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. I removed my head when I felt the need to begin breathing again. Now, though, it was my turn to comfort. Her face was concerned, eyes lost in thought, staring into the distance. I asked her, mocking the tone that couples use to ask each other questions in those movies from long ago. What troubles you, my dear? She sighed and said, What happens if we don't make it in time? I also sighed and looked down again. She tried to pull me back in. However, I resisted to say one last thing. If we don't make it, then I will stand and fight for my life and that of my comrades. She stopped then asked after a pause, What about me? She was curious as to why she was left out of that statement. I was happy to explain. Svetlana, you are a given, because you are a part of me. I maneuvered myself so that our faces could touch, and within a few moments I felt us drawing closer. We kissed again, but this time there was no flash of light to cut us off. Our eyes closed, and I felt nothing but her. We shared that moment for what felt like ages, until light started to fill my closed eyes. I felt her body dissolve away in my arms, and I fell limp against the towels in the sand. I knew what was coming. The real world came back into being as I opened my eyes, and I found myself laying on a cot in the hospital, stripped down in a hospital gown just as Lieutenant Petrenko was walking in the door. What is your favourite ancient legend or story? I mean, that's going to be a little difficult to answer, considering you have no way to respond to me, but you can post it somewhere, and I may see it. One of my favourites is the legend of King Arthur and Excalibur. The contemporary legend, in a very simplified form, goes that, as a teenager, the young Sir Arthur became King Arthur when he drew a sword from a rock, after a sorcerer named Merlin declared that the man who could draw that sword would be king of Logris, an ancient term for Britain. Although there is a bit of disconnect, because in the legend the sword drawn from the stone is not actually Excalibur, and is broken in short order. Excalibur is given to King Arthur by the Lady of the Lake later on in his journey. The rest is not important for you to know, at least not right now. As you may be able to guess, the reason I'm laying on the exposition is that, yes, Excalibur is real. It is a magical blade used by a man named Arthur in olden times, although the legend has been muddied through time by major historical events, most notably the Black Plague, where such a huge portion of Europe's population was killed that a lot of the time nobody really knew what was going on. Our supposition as an organization is that the legend has some truth to it. Nobody's sure exactly how true, or if any of the story itself is true, but one thing we do know for certain, the sword exists, and is indeed imbued with magical power. Exactly how much, we are unsure. The only times we tried to use it, the person testing it almost died, and that was not a fun experience. We know that it increases the wielder's physical strength astronomically, and that its appearance alone has the tendency to stun people looking at it, other than its wielder, of course. However, this wielder is put under an immense amount of psychological and physiological stress, describing the experience as one hell of a ride. They are in control of themselves, however it takes a lot of strength to maintain their consciousness, and, though they are stronger, it takes an immense amount of effort to control the blade, as well as their body, 
His reflexes are heightened beyond what should be physically possible with the function of human nerve cells. Excalibur's retrieval was, of course, a me job. It was discovered by a paranormal cult in England, whose objective of worship was, oddly enough, a block of red granite about the size of a human head, which, through some unknown process, was made perfectly. When I say perfectly, I don't mean just well done, or made with care, or anything like that. Its measurements were immaculate, so precise that our tools could not measure the imperfection it is, if there were any. The labs later figured out this object was not formed in any part of earthbound geological process, and have tentatively labelled it as extraterrestrial. On base, we just call it the Eye Rock. Anyways, these cultists had built a small compound around the place where they found Excalibur, and the British government was having none of it. They'd surrounded the place with a unit of police initially, although the cultists had gotten their hands on some surplus Soviet Union automat Kalashnikovs, and were using them to great effect on the police's limited armaments. This was a few years ago when the police were still ramping up their militarization to fight knife crime, so they had a limited amount of G36 assault rifles and HK45 SMGs to use against these particularly well-armed guys. Then, the rumors started because when the cultists still had internet access, a few shaky handheld videos were posted online of people trying to pull the sword out and failing. However, the reason they failed was not just because they couldn't pull it out. When someone sat there and tried to pull the sword out for more than a few seconds, they would be delivered a visible, golden, electric-like shock that ran over their whole body and often stopped their hearts at the very least throw them off of the boulder that the sword appeared to have been sloppily slammed into. In the room was a defibrillator machine, for the express purpose of reviving those who died trying to pull the sword out. This was when the information blackout took hold. The British media was silenced, and the videos were archived, then removed from the internet. Then, the British made their attempt at removing the blade. A whole army unit surrounded the place with armoured vehicles, and the police were sent home with the understanding that, if they said anything, they would be thrown in the prison system for a fabricated hate crime against Muslims, which in most circumstances is as good as a death sentence due to the high number of Muslims in Britain's prisons. The cultists were easy pickings for the SAS guys they sent in to clear the area. They wiped out the perimeter in a matter of minutes, clearing the way for their team of glow-in-the-dark specialists, who were formally attached to the British Secret Scientific Intelligence Agency, MI16. It was supposed to have been merged into MI6 after the end of the Second World War, but that was a cover-up. These guys are scary, not simply because of the fact that they're all high-tech and high-speed, but because they're absolutely ruthless. Nobody knows where they came from or how they got that way, but even to me, they're just plain scary. They went into the building, and to be quite honest, I don't want to describe the things they did inside, from the limited knowledge of what I know they did. Let's just say that not a single one of the cultists came out of the building warm, and most were unrecognisable, especially not by dental records. But the MI16 guys had no better luck than the cultists, so they called us in. And, before I continue, I must note that not all paranormal events happen like this. Sometimes, nations figure out a way to deal with it on their own. I'm sure most governments are in possession of many artifacts we know nothing about, especially in Area 52, Area 51's lesser-known stepchild. <laughs> of course, you didn't hear any of that from me. So... We left from Kandahar in a private jet chartered so graciously by the British government. In fact, it was already in the airspace over us when they called, telling us they were hiring us for a job. They didn't ask. They merely informed us that your services have been requested by the Crown. And that was that. For this mission, since we would need no special local help or guides, it was just me and another operative. 
Kayoshi. Often it's shortened to Kayo. It's, it's just more convenient. Well, he was a good guy. A little arrogant and boorish at times, but he was very respectful when it mattered, and more often than not, he would rather be cautious than get caught out in the open. We arrived on a typical rainy English afternoon, and as our jet taxied to a stop on the runway, a trio of big black Land Rovers came out to greet us, headlights off. Kyo and I quickly loaded our gear in under the misting rain and hopped in with the lead vehicle. Kyo took shotgun, and I sat in the back with another MI-16 guy, and it didn't take long to get there, or at least by my standards. In Europe, you can see the Brandenburg Gate, the Eiffel Tower, and Big Ben all in the same day. In America, you have to book a hotel just to see two famous buildings in a week. The compound was surrounded by a practical ring of military troops, supplanted by a police cordon on the outer reaches of the zone. Inside of the military perimeter, however, was MI-16 territory. Men with ominous, face-hiding S-10 gas masks, which they wore for no apparent reason, surrounded the compound walls, carrying HK-416 rifles, a variant of the AR-15 M-16 platform. We drove up, and Kyo cheekily asked the driver, Why the masks? You guys too ugly to show your face? The driver just looked at him like he was some sort of imbecile and said nothing. Kyo smiled. He'd expected no response. I looked out the windows as we pulled to a stop, along with the two other Land Rovers. The driver looked back at me and said in a strong Cockney accent, I'm not sure about your buddy here, but I'd like to know your name so we can communicate if need be. I calmly stared at him as he waited for a response, drawing out the silence just long enough to be awkward, and then said, No names. We have no idea what could happen here, so it's best for us to conceal our identity from any entity that could harm us or our families. He started right back, and asked, irritated, Then, what the bloody hell should we call you? I responded, my usual cheery self, and said, Call me Hammer 2-1, or Hammer Actual. I pointed to Keo, saying, This is Hammer 2-2. Two two. He's very pleased to make your acquaintance, as you can tell. The driver merely scowled, turned around in his seat and said, Fine then, Hammer Actual. Get out of my rover and make sure you grab your luggage out of the boot. Keo and I dismounted and grabbed our gear. Several military-grade plastic boxes with foam contained our equipment, and we had the others in the vehicle with us help unload it all. The whole time, the entire cadre of masked men stood there, staring at us through the dark lenses that covered their eyes, motionless. It's almost like this was a show to us more than anything. Well, and I have a theory as to why they cover their faces. It's twofold. The first is the dehumanization of it all. Their faces being absent gives them a distinctly inhuman feel. It's a common tactic in movies, and even among riot police. The second is that they just might have trouble living with the things they've done, so they cover their humanity up behind that mask and hide inside of it. Well, whatever the reason, we were soon on the way in, tubs of measuring equipment and all. Kyo and I both had been allowed to carry a sidearm, just in case, but no long guns. Too risky, they said. <laughs> risky, my ass. They're just scared of us. We made our way through the compound, which internally was laid out in a five-pointed star. Originally, there had been more walls keeping things separate, but there was little by the way of privacy now. Nearly every door was either simply smashed or the lock had been torn out of its mountings by a well-placed application of shotguns or explosives. The entire place was eerily lit with construction lights and generators, as the power had been cut days ago. Several walls here were just plain blown out, and many were torn to pieces by the sheer amount of rounds put through them. Kyo and I looked around at the chaos that was this facility and considered once again the men standing outside. I tapped his shoulder, and pointed at a room that we were walking past. 
It was pitch black, but we could see and smell well enough the gory mess that it contained. His face said all I needed to know. He was disgusted. I was too, but as per my usual, I didn't show it as much as everyone around me. Even the guys who walked in with us were turned away from it, their noses held. We finally reached the room that contained the sword. Room, I say, because the walls were completely shredded. The entire area looked to be the source of some kind of blast, originating from the stone itself. Well, that was partially correct, because as soon as we walked in, the lead driver said, Well, here it is, boys. We've tried everything to get it out, even blew it up, and nothing. Kyo snickered under his breath. He was, to say the least, upset about the fact that these guys would try and blow something up like this. Kyo and I walked closer to the stone while the others stood back. I motioned down, then towards me with my hand and said, Set the containers down and get my visor out of the one with the laser radiation sticker. Kyo stood there and watched. Although they'd set down the boxes and retrieved the item, the men refused to come any closer. The one who held the visor, Irish oddly enough, said, No way I'm getting closer to that thing. Kiss my bloody arse. Kyo rolled his eyes and strode over, grabbing the visor out of his hands, simply saying, Coward. He walked up behind me, slid the visor onto my head, and then pressed the button on the left side that turned it on. It bears serious resemblance to both the Spectrum and Microsoft HoloLens. However, it is neither. It is the pure scientific version of a spec, with no combat additions. The system initialized, and said in big, translucent blue letters in front of my eyes, Connect Pod 1, 2, 3. I was about to tell the men to get on it, but Kia already had. Soon enough, the sensor pods were up and running, standing on different heights of tripod legs, surrounding the object completely. They linked up wirelessly as soon as they powered up, and the numbers disappeared sequentially from the text until the message itself was wiped from the screen. The room lit up, and all around the boulder were some kind of energy anomaly. Random regions of the air which had higher temperatures than the rest of the room, along with some kind of electrostatic interference. This was nothing compared to the object itself, however, which the visor simply outlined with a red dotted line, with a linked line of text saying, Unreadable. In the terms of the tech, this meant that the object was so anomalous that it simply could not be assessed by the visor. As the crowd looked on, I pressed a button on the right, cycling through different individual modes. Thermal showed that the temperature of the blade varied so heavily that the different colours all swirled together, creating a sort of rainbow-coloured puke. It was so electrostatically charged that I took a step back, chuckling and saying quietly, We should all be dead. I was thinking internally, What the frick is this thing? Then, it started speaking to me. It was a low rumble at first, but it got louder over time. It was only repeating one thing. So many. Not worthy. You. Worthy. It sounded as if multiple instances of it existed, all speaking to me at once, continuously repeating that one line and overlapping, ever so slightly getting louder over time. As soon as I became aware of this fact, I whipped around and asked the men breathlessly, Have there been any reports of hearing voices? One of them, holding a file, looked startled and spoke to me quickly. What? How did you? Before realising that I was probably hearing them. Yes, as you can likely hear, and if you value your sanity, you'll want to leave. Most people can't stand that thing telling them that they aren't worthy, and it only gets louder over time. A twinkle flashed in my eye, or at least that's the way Keo described it afterwards, because what I did next I, I have little recollection of. In fact, I don't remember anything between when I grabbed the sword 
When I woke up a week later in a village on the coast, in a crown and knight's armour, standing in the village square, wielding the blade with both hands. My recollection of those few moments was crystal clear, however. The blade spoke to me in a clear, concise, mostly genderless tone. Call me, and I shall come. My name is Excalibur, and you are my king. Nobody knows what I did during that time, least of all me, but I do have some vague feelings from what happened while I was out. And let me tell you, it felt like one hell of a ride. Well, I hold my hands up, that wasn't the one that won the vote that I put on the uh, community tab on the channel, but, well, like I said, that was going to take uh, 90 minutes of narration, plus editing and uh, all the other stuff that's involved in making these videos, and I just simply didn't have time this evening. So I promise, promise, promise I will do that next weekend. Uh, the winning one, that is, of course. But I hope you enjoy part six of this series. It's um, ever popular, and um, I'm sure you enjoyed that, didn't you? Well... Back again tomorrow night. Oh my god, can you believe it? And I've got another monster story for you. Best part of two hours of narration coming up in tomorrow's story. Um, already recorded and ready to go. So, you're going to join me, aren't you? Go on, say so you will. Yes, you will. There you go. Well, enjoy the rest of your Sunday, and I will see you again tomorrow. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye.